Hello everyone. Today on Exploring the Coast with Hannah, we are going to explore the life cycle of the acanthocephalin parasite that uses the Pacific mole crab, Emerita analoga, as a host. We will then conduct a real sand crab dissection to look at these parasites up close and personal. A parasite is an organism that lives in or on a host by either another animal or plant and usually causes harm to its host organism. Nearly all animals have parasites and they are therefore an important part of ecosystems. There are many different types of parasites, including parasitic worms. Members of the phylum Acanthocephala are known as spiny headed worms, are common parasites found in sand crabs. In the ocean, acanthocephalin eggs float freely in the water until they are accidentally ingested by suitable intermediate hosts, which means it uses the host to grow into their juvenile stage but cannot reproduce. Since Pacific mole crabs are filter feeders, they end up filtering and ingesting the acanthocephalin eggs and become prime intermediate hosts for the parasites. The parasites are not lethal to the mole crabs, although they could affect their behavior perhaps, making them easier prey for fish and birds. Next stage for the parasites is moving to a definitive host. A definitive host will become infected when it ingests an infected mole crab. Various coastal birds are a definitive host for the acanthocephalin, meaning that the parasite develops into an adult and can reproduce. The parasite then enters the small intestine and matures into an adult worm. Eggs are then produced by the adult acanthocephalins and pass out of the bird in the bird's feces back into the ocean to continue the cycle. The parasites affect California sea otters as well but they are called a dead-end host because the parasites are not able to reproduce nor continue their life cycle. In both definitive and dead-end hosts, parasites that reside in the intestine migrate through the intestinal wall, allowing bacteria to infect the abdominal cavity. This causes death among many coastal birds and sea otters. Hello everyone, welcome to my kitchen floor. Uh, here we are today about to start our crab dissection. Uh, so you saw in the previous slideshow uh, the life cycle of these acanthocephalin parasites and how they get into the sand crab. And so right now I'm gonna show you how we conduct these dissections step by step and let's see if we can find any parasites. So as you can see here and from what we talked about uh, last week of sand crab anatomy, so we're going to actually uh, open up the carapace right here. So this is the really large top shell of the Pacific mole crab. But for us to be able to, to cut through the carapace, we first have to take off the telson. So remember what I talked about uh, last week about the movable telson that sand crabs use to burrow into the sand. Uh, once you lift them up, that's how we were able to tell the gender of the specific mole crabs. Uh, so as we can see here, there are pleopods, so the swimming legs, and so only females have those pleopods. So this is in fact a female. You can also tell by her large size that it's a female as opposed to a male. So what we're going to do is, is we're actually going to cut right here, uh, right where the carapace ends and the telson begins. So we'll get the tail out of the way. Pardon me. And so I'm going to take my scissors. All right, and we'll try to get as close as possible. And I'm going to cut right here. So. There you can see uh, we cut off the carapace, or I'm sorry, the telson, uh, which allows us to be able to open up the carapace here. All right, so what we're gonna do is, it's kind of like butterflying a shrimp or uh, cutting uh, wrapping paper. 
Uh, so when at Christmas time, when you're trying to get that, that perfect cut on the wrapping paper, it's kind of the same way here. So what's going to happen is I'm going to, as we can see right here, there's this, this opening. And so instead of wanting to cut the crab in half, right, we want to just cut the carapace. So I'm going to gently put the scissors just underneath the carapace. I'm going to start cutting in a straight line just like this. You hear a little crunch, I'm sorry. All right, so we're cutting that carapace open to allow us to explore the mid-gut area where we're gonna look for these acanthocephalin parasites. So in order to do that, we have to pull the carapace kind of up, kind of like uh, butterfly doors on an expensive car, those expensive cars that have those Cool butterfly door. So we're gonna just pull it off. Again, we'll do it very, very gently. Sorry for the camera. Uh, just to pull up a little bit like that. All right. It's a little gross, I know. Okay, so I'll move the camera just a little bit. All right, you can see here that I actually can see some parasites uh, just by looking at it. So if you guys can see these little, um, white things that look like Tic Tacs, uh, those are in fact the acanthocephalin parasites. Uh, so we're going to explore a little bit using our tweezers to pick out a couple of these acanthocephalin parasites. And this one actually, this female actually has a lot of them if you can see them right here. So they look like little Tic Tacs. And so I'm going to get these with my tweezers. So if you can, sorry it's not in focus, but you can see right here, I'll do a little close up of it uh, in just a minute. I'm gonna put them in another Petri dish. So right now we've got one, two, actually that has another one. So we have three, you can see more, four, seven, Eight, nine, there's two right there, as you can see. Oops, dropped one back in there. Keep kind of looking through the mid gut area. Okay. And so remember, these are intermediate hosts. So these parasites do not harm the sand crabs. Uh, they just use them uh, as kind of vessels to get to the definitive or dead end hosts, um, which cause a lot more trouble. And with the definitive hosts, that's the ones that they actually use to reproduce in. So I think for this dissection, that's about it. So I believe we had about nine of them. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is, is you can see some of these right here that we have found. I'm going to put them, uh, put a little bit of tap water in there and give it about 10 to 15 minutes to see if we can see the heads of these acanthocephalin parasites come out. So normally if you put them in fresh water, the heads of them will come out. So give me a few moments and, and let's see if these guys are, will come out. All right, everyone. So it's been about 15 minutes uh, since I put some fresh water into the Petri dish with the parasites. And as you can see here, we actually have a couple of them. My finger can follow it, where the head has come out. Uh, so remember from the presentation that the acanthocephalin worms are known as spiny headed worms or spiny headed parasites. And so that's how they, they get their name from that because you can see here and I don't have a, a very good close-up of it, I won't be able to see, but they do have these little spines right there on their heads. Uh, so we got about nine of these from that, that female, so that's a good amount. Uh, in, some pair, in some sand crabs, we can find up to 20, 25 parasites per crab. So I hope you guys learned a lot today about the acanthocephalin parasite and the effects that it causes on Pacific mole crabs as well as coastal birds and sea otters. And tune in next week uh, for Exploring the Coast with Hannah. Next Tuesday at 11 a.m. I will be going over the different zones that you find in the Rocky Intertidal habitats. Have a great day, everyone.